you just go like this, that's how she would smile. Whole yeah. gummy smile went to her back here. And we were talking about this yesterday and Michael that does with them, he's like, oh, um, he's like, it's so tiring. And I'm like, what? And he's like, just smiling that much, your cheeks hurt. I don't know how she does it. She can be smiling for life. All the time. <laughs> Anyway, first of all, I bought chocolates for everyone. This is my birthday yesterday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Spencer had a teddy bear chocolate last night when he got home. Yeah, that was thanks to A-Line. I know. <laughs> so I'm going to take the lid off. The lid is now destroyed, so they have to be eaten by you lot. So please take two or three to pass them around. Someone's going to do it, though. Someone's going to do it. <laughs> He's like challenging. Yeah. Okay, so what, today. <laughs> so today we're going to look at object oriented programming uh, and why it's useful. Um, for those who've done proper computer coding and proper object oriented programming, R is different. It doesn't have the proper structure that they do. But I'm going to teach you what R does and why it's useful. Okay. So if you're not already loaded it, you'll need Tidyverse for this. I want to illustrate what object-oriented programming in R is trying to do. But it's probably a thing you've never thought about. Consider these commands here. First of all, I create a vector of just the numbers 1, 2, 10. Right? And when I do a summary of that, it gives me the min, the first quartile, the median, the mean, etc. Fine. But then I get a data frame, and I call summary, and I get a completely different output. So the fact that you can use the same function summary, and the output you get depends on what you pass it, is what object-oriented programming in R is all about. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to work out what R is doing underneath to do that structure. How does it know that X it should do one sort of summary and a data frame a different sort of summary? Okay? So that's what S3ROP is all about. So it's all about underneath everything they have labels, what they call class, and they are just simple character labels. So if you look at X, its class is integer. But if you look at MPG, it's class here. It has three classes. It's a data frame, it's also a tibble, and it's a tibble data frame. So every object in R has a class or a list of classes, and they're going to tell R how to deal with it. When you go plot, print, summary, it looks first of all at the class and says, what class object is this? Is there an appropriate function to deal with that class? And then that's what it calls. So underneath R, you don't realize it, there is a basically a summary dot data frame, a summary dot integer, a summary dot everything. Okay? So that's what S3OOP is all about. So it is a generic function calling, is the proper name. You create these functions called generics. And then when you pass it an object, the first thing I'll do is it goes, what sort of object is it? Now I'll go to my list of the generics to find the appropriate thing to do. Okay? So we're gonna do this. We're gonna create our own class called PropCI that's going to do confidence intervals for sample proportions, or for population proportions, using the sample proportion. So that's what we're gonna create ourselves. We're gonna create ourselves a new class. So the first thing we do is we're going to create a constructor. This is a function that will take a load of inputs. And this is going to create a list. And then the final thing I do is I give this list a class called prop.ci underscore ci. So I want you to go and get that from the internet. It should be on there. Download it. And try running it by giving it some data.
So you should find that is available for you to download, hopefully, if I set it up right, on the web page. So if you look at this function, it takes a vector of treatments, so it's going to be a categorical variable, and it also takes a vector of responses, and first it puts them together in a data thing, and then it creates some, as you can see, some asymptotic 95% confidence intervals for the different treatment levels. Then it adds, it's created the whole thing as a list, so you've got this object called list, it contains two things, data and CI. And then it adds, it just gives it a name, it gives it a label. Okay? Now, here's an example. So I've set up X, I'm repeating the letters ABC 20 times. I've created some data. And now if I go prop CI X comma Y, it spits out my list where the first entry is data, and here's the actual data, and the second is my confidence interval. What it's done is for the different treatments, A, B, C, it gives me how many successes, how many observations, the sample proportion, the lower and upper 95% confidence interval for each of them treatments using what we call asymptotic confidence intervals. That is a rubbish constructor. Absolute rubbish. Improve it. So you've got 10 minutes to start thinking about how you can prove it. Whenever you get a function, the first thing you should start to do, add your comments at the start that say what goes in, what goes out, who wrote it, what does it do. You should then think about the next thing is how do you make sure that what I pass in is correct? So you should have some checks in there to say, look, because there's nothing there. I told you, I said, oh, the first column is categorical variables. The second column is a response variable. Like, we assume that they're the same length and things like that. So start writing that. Also, let's face it, I've got a hard-coded 1.96 in there. Never have a magic number like that. That's a terrible thing. You come to change this, and imagine it's got 200 lines of code and you want it to be a 95, uh, sorry, 90% comps interval, you have to change that. So, make it better. I'll give you, let's say it's all 10.30. Then I'll show you my version, so you use it best. <laughs> Um, just to remind you, this improver is also um, it's an iterative process. What I mean by that is I try and think of all the ways that me, myself, as a code in the future, will fuck things up. So the classic thing is I will send in vectors of the wrong length and not going to be categorical, things like that. But then what happens is it's amazing how me, myself, as a coder, is really inventive in finding new ways to fuck up. So in the future, every time I manage to find a way to fuck up, I now go back to my original function and add in extra code to stop me as a coder from fucking up myself. Think about every single time travel move you've ever seen, try and do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> it fell and it made it all the way. But none came out. That's because there's like two left at the bottom. Four. <laughs> you better just make sure that everyone on the recording knows there was a big box of chocolates for everyone who came to the workshop. And then they went past Josh.
Is Mono an actual common I've Australian never had child? it outside of... Yeah, I've never yeah. had it. I didn't know it was because I'm an English person who didn't have it in England. It's kind of like a Mars bar, right? In Mars yeah, I've yeah, never had it outside yeah. of the favourite box. Though. No, I've never. Yeah. How do you become a favourite if it was never outside the favourite box? That if it was never a favourite that you could purchase. Mm. But how do you get a favourite? Everyone buys it. <laughs> 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 Alright, Alright. 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 Make it one of your. But you can buy it now, though. Can you buy it now, though? Oh, I don't want to. Are you feeling more? Yeah. Sounds like you're going. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even read that bit. Okay. It's not even a Mars bar. Yeah. Not a Mars bar. Not exactly. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I was probably, I probably, I was probably down sweet. four ones of the The function, all the chains is what, like two gamma on the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, If in doubt, look at it. It also it shouldn't bear, it shouldn't change is the thing though, because you spend you spend half the amount of time in each compartment, but there are two compartments now. Mm. So you still infect the same number of the same amount of time infected, but it should be the same function. Yeah. yeah. And that has the same thing. So it doesn't. Uh, yeah, the function and the uh which they will check have the same thing. Yeah, but yeah, that works on yeah. But your um probability of antiquity okay. does it have the same thing? Because that would, and this, you should be infected the same number of people, you get the same amount of time where your equal should catch it. Yeah. I will be looking at just the question because now I will. Okay, so here's my function. First of all, notice that the comments at the start are this hash dash, which will be important when we get to do our packages in a workshop in two weeks' time, because that up at the top is a thing called Roxygen, and Roxygen can be automatically converted into help pages in your package. So I'll show you about that. But you can see that what I've got, the form of it is, I have first of all a single line that just says, what does this do? And then I've got this format, this at param, says what are the parameters? Now I've got a treatment, a response, and a confidence interval. And I've got a default value of my confidence interval, because I thought, well, I might want to do different confidence intervals, so let's put it in. But let's have a default. So don't put anything in there, it automatically does 0.95, so 95% confidence interval. I explained to myself, and it is seriously to myself, that this is a vector of treatment. The response is a binary vector of value of zero, failure, one success. The nice thing is every time you start writing all these parameters and you think about what it is, you think about the check you can do. 
So you can go, okay, maybe I need to check that it's only zeros or ones. Okay. I then say what it returns. It returns a prop CI object. It contains the data and the table of the confidence intervals. I have some examples, and we'll see that when we get to our packages, some examples you can call directly in your from your package and it will run it for you. So then I have my function, then I've got some check inputs. I use stop if not. So first of all, the first thing I said is look. Make sure that the length of the treatment is equal to the length of the response. And what it does is each of these ones, it will check them, and if it's not, it will stop and tell you why it stopped. So it's saying I stop because the length of this is not equal to the length of this. I went take the response, unique it, and do the length. What's this doing? It's saying, do you only have two types of response? That's all that one's doing. So I started to think, well, what do I want? I want sort of two types of response, so I did that check. And then I actually said, I expect all the response are in either zero or one. So the third line says, the, the second line says you've only got two types of values in your response. The third one says, and they're only a zero or one. Doesn't the third line make the second line move? Yeah, but I could now change if I wanted to. And it was just the way I was thinking about it. I went, I just want two values. I went, actually, I just want zero or one. Yes, I could get rid of it, but I left it in as an example of stuff you could consider. Um, I now comment every single bit to create a data frame from the inputs, calculate the confidence using asymptotic normal calculation. Maybe put a link to where you got that calculation from. This one is just from a standard textbook. Here I've got my Z star, I calculate my confidence interval. Then it's the rest of the code we had before with just comments. Okay. So all this command does is a standard function. In this particular case, it returns a list. It doesn't have to return a list. You can return whatever it wants. And the thing that's different is just before I spit it out, I set the class to a name. In this case, I said the class is a prop CI. So this is my constructor. It constructs one of these CI objects. You could cheat. You could take any object, and you could just go class of this object equals CI prop. And as far as I was concerned, that's now CI prop. Of course. If you now try and run the rest of the stuff, it's going to break itself really quickly because it's going to start assuming that you have this particular object. But notice, unlike a lot of other languages, there's no checkers. There's nothing in S3 that actually says, if you say this is a CI object, does it have all these bits? It's a very loose type of object oriented. A lot of other, other object oriented, if you went, this is a object of this type, it would do a lot of checking to say, no, it's not. That's not a date frame, mate. Just stop where you are. It's very, very dangerous that way. There is an S4 that has proper constructors with proper validation and checkers, but it's not as nice as this. This is quick and dirty, but it works really well. So now we've got that, and you've got your better function. You know if you type X or MPG or something like that, and then it appears on the screen. What that's actually do when you just type the name of the object is it's calling the print function. So it goes and says, is the restrictions on how to print a tibble? Is the restrictions on how to print a data frame? Is the restrictions on how to print an integer? So if we write a function called print dot and then the name of our class, when you now call that object just straight off, that's how it will print it out to the screen. If not, it just goes to the standard format, just printing everything. So we're going to write a print function. So here's my print function. It's called print dot, and then the name of the class. Remember, our class is called prop underscore ci. I've got function, and I'm going to pass it an object. And I've just got some nice stuff that says, first of all, cat. So I put it out to the screen. This is a prop ci object, end of line, end of line. Then I thought I'd give some summary. So I said, cat, the number of observations is n row obt dollar data. So we know that there's a thing called a data framing data in this obt I've passed through, and then a summary table. So now when I create my prop xi and I just type ci object, I don't get like I got before it went dollar data or the data dollar ci or the ci. Now it just prints a nice formatted thing. So type that in, have a go. 
you really want to freak yourself out, just get the skeleton of that print.ci, leave it blank, and then go and type your object, your CI object, and you see that nothing appears. And you're like, shit, what's gone wrong? Because you set your print just to do diddly squat, so it does diddly squat. I only know that because that's what I did when I first created my skeleton. And I had my thing all it and everything disappeared. I'm like, what? what? Oh, because I haven't actually done anything. Because the old print dot proxy, I'm full did that. It's actually it's using the default. Print. We'll get to that, but it's basically before you went yeah, print, you went right. Is there a print dot um, prop underscore ci? No. There will be a print dot default, and the print dot default will just take everything in that structure and just print it to the screen. So we are overriding that by doing this. Yes. Well, no, you're not overwriting that. What you're doing is you're creating a new function that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. What happened before is it just had a default function it could use. And obviously you could adjust this to whatever way you want. It's a very nice way of thinking about... I once saw a talk by uh, Badley, who does a lot of spatial statistics, and he was creating the point processes, and he said the nice thing about writing S3 objects is you have to then think about what will the plot function do, what will the print function do, what will the summary function do. So it makes you think about your object. And if you want, have a mess around with. Get it to actually, instead of say print, you know, this is a prop CI object, you know, this is a prop CI object created by, and whatever your name is. So who, when they wrote their constructor function, actually put in some argument verification? The stock is Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so nice. <laughs> 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 I wrote a code myself saying, check this. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't have all of them, but I had stop it, like that. I had stop it, not the link. Yeah, that's good. Stop it, not is a great function. We all forget to use it, we should all use it. Did you do it, Patrick? I checked if it was available, but it exists. But nice. What's different? That, no, it's not wrong different. As long as you had some argument verification, that's perfect. I wonder why I had this in. Well, you've had to go through this on a one to one tutorial, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> How many have got their print function to work? Not none of you? Or all of you? Why is it not working? I don't know. Because I changed the line. Because I, when I changed the line, I put my print value in the middle and it wasn't I should say that. You've got responses missing. I know, I don't know why. The response is here. That's all right. Got it working? Not working. Good. Yeah, you copy and paste, it, but it's a cool thing to do. We're just looking at assignments, seeing how well this, how this relates to the assignments. Yeah, almost exactly. Yes, of course it does. That's how I construct assignments. You've got yeah. the structure. I mean, you've got to think about your individual thing and how you're going to do it and make it all up. But it's nice. So next one, plot. You can also write a plot function. Which you knew about. I mean, if you've done that thing where you just sort of plot some data and it just gave you the points, and then you go plot to a linear model and it gives you your four assumption checking plots. Because there's a plot.lm and a plot.data frame and a plot.etc. So what I've done with this one is that notice what I do is I'm using ggplot, so I create a ggplot object and save it as p, and then I return p. 
I don't go print P or something like that, I actually turn P because maybe your plot, once you've produced it, you might want to change some stuff, you might want to switch off the legends, etc. So now you can just take the object, plus extra stuff, and you can still convert it. So in this case, I decided that we'd just do a ggplot where I take my object, and in fact, I take the data frame CI that's contained within that object, I know will be there, do ASS treatment comma P, plus some points, plus some error bars, change my limits, add the portions of treatments and return it. And what you get is a pretty plot so when I just go plot CI, it does my 95% confidence plots. Now, obviously, you can improve that. You know, if you change your thing, maybe we need to have a thing in our print function that tells you what level of confidence it's set at. And maybe now in your plot, it can look at the level of that confidence. So if you think about your original constructor, we can now go back and improve it and say, perhaps in your list, there should be an extra thing called level. We set it at 0.95, but with the other one, so now when I produce this plot, the title could automatically say something like 95% or 90%, et cetera, confidence intervals. Now you see the iterative process. You look at it and go, that's all right, but it can be improved. You go back and you improve it. And you just change what's in your list at the end of your function. Yes, you can add extra stuff there. You're just creating this list of objects, so you can just add extra stuff in there as you need it. Okay, so that's fine. We know there's some standards. the summary, this plot, this print, the ones you see. But sometimes you might want to create your own new generic function that you're gonna use for different classes or different objects. So in this case, I want something that's not standard. It's not a plot, a print, or summary. I want to have a new function called CI that will do CIs, confidence intervals, for different objects. So for this one, it will return my confidence intervals, but maybe I could then have a CI function that would work on other objects. It could work on an integer object. It could work on various things. So how did R set up its plot print or something in the first place? It set it up as a generic function. And it looks like a nothing, but what you're doing here is you're going to create your CI. It's going to be a function that's going to take a single value. And it's saying use method CI. So it's saying, and it seems like a recursive thing, and it is, it's just saying, if anyone calls CI, I want to use method CI. It's basically saying to R, look, this is not just a single function, this is going to be a function that's going to have a CI dot something, a CI dot something. It's gonna be a whole family of CI functions. So that's what that's doing, it's saying set up as a family of functions, or in other words, it's saying, if anyone ever calls CI, you're going to have to check the class and then find the appropriate CI dot whatever. That's all it's doing. So the first thing we do is we need a default. Because it's really nice to say, I don't have a CI function for this particular thing, so at least it tells you. And to do that, you just call it CI dot default function X. And it says, this method is for use with a prop CI object. Your object is this, so fuck off. But it says it politely, oh. although I did once write code that would swear at me. And then I gave the code to someone else. It was Ben Binder. And he came and he said, your code just told me there's no LaTeX file for you, fat boy. Why? <laughs> and I went, well, actually, it's because you have to put this information into the data frame. I got bored at one point, so I started to write that all my error messages were just swearing. Then, of course, I started to share my code with people, and I had to get a lot of code back and change it to be a bit more professional. So the first thing we do is this default. And all default does is it says, if I pass anything in that isn't something I have a function for, it lets me know. And in fact, at this point, if you call this CI on your prop underscore CI, it will return the default message because we haven't written how to deal with that yet. And you can try that CI now on everything. Try a data frame, try a string, and all of them should just go, nope, not gonna deal with it. 
I literally can't even right now. That's what I should say. You <laughs> literally can't even what? I literally can't even right now. <laughs> but I'm gonna make my function do. So obviously now we've set up our generic and we set up our default. Now let's set up the thing that we really wanted to do, which is to take our object and return the confidence interval. Hello. Yeah? Um, we've got CI1 to 20. Should, should it be CI default? No. I've created a vector 1 to 10. Okay. So this okay. is just a vector. Yeah. So when I did CI and bracket and gave it a vector, it went up here and it went right. So it's called CI. Is there a CI dot, in this case, integer? Mm -hmm. It went, no, let's do what the default does. So it came to default and said, look, I can't do anything, it's an integer. Okay. So I just created on the fly an anonymous um, vector of integers. And here is my really boring ci dot prop underscore ci. Because I already have calculated everything. So all this does is it returns whatever is the data frame within that. So now if I go ci, ci object, it returns my data frame. So this is actually, you have a lot of assessor and mutator functions in object oriented. Mutators will change the data within the object. Assessors will just spit it out. So we've just written a basic assessor function. We've just returned part within it. You could have done this cheaply just by going, in this case, ci underscore object dollar, and then just said ci, it would have been exactly the same. But this is just a nice, cleaner way of doing it. You've actually created an assessor function. And that is the entirety of everything you really need to know about S3 OOP. Um, the main difference between this and S4, S4 is much more controlled. And now if you want to get inside, the, the stuff contained with inside are accessed using the at rather than dollar. And they have now what we call slots. And they've got much more construction. This is really useful because you now understand how to set up your object. You're doing something again and again, and you just like to be able to go plot, print, summary. It's a quick way of doing it. I'm going to get you to do it in the next assignment. It should follow pretty well from this. You just have to tidy it up and think cleverly about how to construct it. Very, very useful for when you start doing your packages, having your S3 objects inside a package makes it much nicer. Because people are used to just going plot, print, summary, etc. Any questions? Easy? Hopefully. Should be easy. So we've got a bit of spare time. I thought, why don't we allocate what you're going to do for your presentations? So I wrote some code this morning. And this is presenting at the end of week 11, right? Yep. So in this room, week 11, this time, you will be presenting to, at the moment I have four of my collaborators who are going to mark you, but I might ask all the statistical lecturers to come and mark you as well. <laughs> so you have to do a four minute presentation using nothing but this document camera, or you don't have to use a document camera. Whiteboards? Nope. Actually, we do have whiteboards. I'm happy for you to use whiteboards if you prefer to use whiteboards. Whiteboard. Yep, yeah, I'm happy for you to do whiteboards. You want to teach them. You're not going to get like Oh, sorry. When I said a statistical lecturer, are you implying that Gary's not a statistical lecturer? No. Is that what you're saying? Should I tell Gary that you don't consider no, him a statistical like a lecturer? That, that's for major review, not the yeah. It's four minutes. It's just a minor review. Yeah. I went, spent week after week in supervising meetings with Gary. You're worried about four minutes? But you're, you're really good. No, I'm not. No, that's the, that's the fallacy of the entirety of education. We've just been doing this incorrectly longer. So let's have a look at do, 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 code. Presentation allocation. So I've got here the code. Well, that was weird. Did you write it in? Of the orange program, you're no, in normal R. just normal R. Like. 
<laughs> so what I've done here is I have the methods. I, I sort of chose 11 methods that I thought are not too bad. We have the 11 people in this course. And I'm going to randomize, we have the standard order, I'm going to randomize the student order. So you're not going to have vertical, you're going to get random. And then randomize the methods to it. And I said to 2019 because that's the year. Have you read this already? You already, you already know who's doing what. Yeah, because I checked my code. I know exactly who's can doing we, what. Can we request a different seed then? Yeah. Can you give me five minutes and I'll request a different seed? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But I like your audacity. <laughs> Is everyone ready? And I will put this up online as well. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know how to do this now. That's the button. There you are. There are the results. There are the order. And they are the, so Miriam, you're doing logistic regression, but you're also going first. That actually worked out quite nice. I, I thought that's the linear regression. I was like, oh, yeah. No, no, logistic. <laughs> and Tobin's LDA, William, Lois, Jan, PCA, Anton, K, nearest neighbors, Curtis, support vector machines, Patrick, Nine Bays, Ashley, Mars, Joshua, Cart. And that's a big field, so I'm happy for you to just focus on one if you want, either classification trees or regression trees. Oh, yeah, see, You've got four minutes, remember? Okay. Dylan, you are Who's random forest. And finally, Anthony, you are last with PCR. If you feel that this is completely unfair and you'd really like to offer me an alternative method for you, contact me, we can discuss it. It has to be of a reasonable level. Um, you have four minutes to do it. If you're not sure how to do anything like that, I'm happy to assist and help. The handout gives you some of the things we're going to be looking at and the general rubric you'll be marked against. I mean, it's only worth 5%. The people I've got to mark you, the collaborators, are particularly nice people who will have a good idea of, yes, that's a reasonable level. Remember, the key concept with this is not to do a full lecture on your method. It's that quick thing you do on a piece of paper over coffee with collaborators where they go, you explain PCA? Yeah, it sort of works like this. Key things I often work about is what sort of data you use it for, what's it doing, what's the pros and cons. Pictures are really good. The use of whiteboards or the document camera will definitely be a nice thing to do. If you're not sure, go back and look at the rubric. If you're really not sure, ask me. If you really hate your method so much it's going to make you lose sleep at night, let me know, we can discuss an alternative. But you should all stand up for four minutes and explain one of these ideas to a domain expert. I think it's a useful skill. It's a skill that I do all the time. Cool, any questions? Brilliant, see you on Monday where we'll learn PCA, which will be particularly useful for Jan. Thank you all. I do think that some of these areas are big. If you wanted to focus it down to a smaller area, come and discuss it with me. Thank you.